The Dragon's Teeth from the Tanglewood Tales Part 3 But often and often at the close of a weary day's journey did Telephasia and Cadmus, Silix and Thasius, remember the pleasant spot in which they had left Phoenix. It was a sorrowful prospect for these wanderers that on the morrow they must again set forth, and that after many nightfalls they would perhaps be no nearer the close of their toilsome pilgrimage than now. These thoughts made them all melancholy at times, but appeared to torment Silix more than the rest of the party. At length, one morning, when they were taking their staves in hand to set out, he thus addressed them. My dear mother, and you, good brother Cadmus, and my friend Thasius, methinks we are like people in a dream. There is no substance in the life which we are leading. It is such a dreary length of time since the white bull carried off my sister Europa that I have quite forgotten how she looked and the tones of her voice, and indeed almost doubt whether such a little girl ever lived in the world, and whether she once lived or no. I am convinced that she no longer survives, and that therefore it is the merest folly to waste our own lives and happiness in seeking her. Were we to find her, she would now be a woman grown and would look upon us all as strangers. So to tell you the truth, I have resolved to take up my abode here, and I entreat you, mother, brother, and friend, to follow my example. Not I for one, said Telefasha, although the poor queen, firmly as she spoke, was so travel-worn that she could hardly put her foot to the ground. Not I for one. In the depths of my heart, little Europa is still the rosy child who ran to gather flowers so many years ago. She has not grown to womanhood, nor forgotten me. At noon, at night, journeying onward, sitting down to rest, her childish voice is always in my ears, calling, Mother, Mother, stop here who may. There is no repose for me. Nor for me, said Cadmus while my dear mother pleases to go onward. And the faithful Thasius, too, was resolved to bear them company. They remained with Silix a few days, however, and helped him build a rustic bower resembling the one which they had formerly built for Phoenix. When they were bidding him farewell, Silix burst into tears and told his mother that it seemed just as melancholy a dream to stay here in solitude as to go onward. If she really believed that they would ever find Europa, he was willing to continue the search with them, even now. But Telefasha bade him remain there and be happy if his own heart would let him. So the pilgrims took their leave of him and departed and were hardly out of sight before some other wandering people came along that way and saw Silic's habitation and were greatly delighted with the appearance of the place there being abundance of unoccupied ground in the neighborhood, these strangers built huts for themselves and were soon joined by a multitude of new settlers who quickly formed a city. In the middle of it was seen a magnificent palace of colored marble, on the balcony of which every noontide appeared Silix in a long purple robe and with a jeweled crown upon his head for the inhabitants, when they found out that he was a king's son, had considered him the fittest of all men to be a king himself. One of the first acts of King Silic's government was to send out an expedition consisting of a grave ambassador and an escort of bold, hardy young men with orders to visit the principal kingdoms of the earth and inquire whether a young maiden had passed through those regions, galloping swiftly on a white bull. It is therefore plain to my mind that Silix secretly blamed himself for giving up the search for Europa as long as he was able to put one foot before the other. As for Telefasha and Cadmus and the good Thasius, it grieved me to think of them still keeping up that weary pilgrimage. The two young men did the best for the poor queen, helping her over the rough places, often carrying her across rivulets in their faithful arms and seeking to shelter her at nightfall even when they themselves lay on the ground. 
Sad, sad it is to hear them asking of every passerby if he had seen Europa so long after the white bull had carried her away. But though the gray years thrust themselves in between and made the child's figure dim in their remembrance, neither of these true-hearted three ever dreamed of giving up the search. One morning, however, poor Thashus found that he had sprained his ankle and could not possibly go a step farther. After a few days, to be sure, said he mournfully, I might make a shift to hobble along with a stick, but that would only delay you and perhaps hinder you from finding dear little Europa after all your pains and troubles. Do you go forward, therefore, my beloved companions, and leave me to follow as I may. Thou hast been a true friend, dear Thashus, said Queen Telephasha, kissing his forehead. Being neither my son nor the brother of our lost Europa, thou hast shown thyself truer to me and her than Phoenix and Silix did, whom we have left behind us. Without thy loving help and that of my son Cadmus, my limbs could not have borne me half so far as this. Now take thy rest and be at peace, for, and it is the first time I have owned it to myself, I begin to question whether we shall ever find my beloved daughter in this world. Saying this, the poor queen shed tears because it was a grievous trial to the mother's heart to confess that her hopes were growing faint. From that day forward, Cadmus noticed that she never traveled with the same alacrity of spirit that had hitherto fore supported her. Her weight was heavier upon his arm. Before setting out, Cadmus helped Thashus build a bower, while Telephasha, being too infirm to give any great assistance, advised him how to fit it up and furnish it so that it might be as comfortable as a hut of branches could be. Thashus, however, did not spend all his days in this green bower. For it happened to him, as to Phoenix and Silix, that other homeless people visited the spot and liked it and built themselves habitations in the neighborhood. So here in the course of a few years was another thriving city with a red freestone palace in the center of it, where Thasha sat upon a throne, doing justice to the people with a purple robe over his shoulders, a scepter in his hand, and a crown upon his head. The inhabitants had made him king not for the sake of any royal blood, for none was in his veins, but because Thashus was an upright, true-hearted, and courageous man, and therefore fit to rule. But when the affairs of his kingdom were all settled, King Thashus laid aside his purple robe and crown and scepter, and bade his worthiest subjects distribute justice to the people in his stead. Then, grasping the pilgrim staff that had supported him so long, he set forth again, hoping still to discover some hoof mark of the snow-white bull, some trace of the vanished child. He returned after a lengthened absence and sat down wearily upon his throne. To his latest hour, nevertheless, King Thasha showed his true-hearted remembrance of Europa by ordering that a fire should always be kept burning in his palace and a bath steaming hot and food ready to be served up and a bed with snow-white sheets in case the maiden should arrive, and require immediate refreshment. And though Europa never came, the good Thashus had the blessings of many a poor traveler who profited from the food and lodging which were meant for little playmate of the king's boyhood. Telephasha and Cadmus were now pursuing their weary way with no companion but each other. The queen leaned heavily upon her son's arm, and could walk only a few miles a day. But for all her weakness and weariness, she would not be persuaded to give up the search. It was enough to bring tears into the eyes of bearded men to hear the melancholy tone with which she inquired of every stranger whether he could tell her any news of the lost child. Have you seen a little girl? No, no. I mean a young maiden, a full grown, passing by this way mounted on a snow-white bull, which gallops as swiftly as the wind. We have seen no such wondrous sight, the people would reply, and very often, taking Cadmus aside, they whispered to him, Is this stately and sad-looking woman your mother? 
Surely she is not in her right mind, and you ought to take her home and make her comfortable and do your best to get this dream out of her fancy. It is no dream, said Cadmus. Everything else is a dream, save that. And I think we're going to stop here, and we'll continue reading this story in the next video. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've reached down, clicked like, and subscribe, and I hope you leave a comment. Love you guys. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. <laughs>